Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased to be here talking at this important conference on this important topic. But let's start off just south of Newcastle, on this lonely hillside with the Angel of the North. Now, the Angel looks down on the people of Tyneside and understands their foibles. Very complicated. But from the point of view of the Angel, perhaps simple. I'd like to encourage you to look on type 2 diabetes from a different perspective and understand some of the simplicity that's concerned with it. For a start, this is all about energy. We need energy as living things. To move here, you'll have burnt fuel. But the magic thing is, you only had a choice of two fuels. If you'd ambled along slowly, you would have been burning fat. If you were late and you'd sprinted, you would have been using glucose. That's it. That's metabolism. We could all go home. <laughs> so we've got to realize there is a driving simplicity behind all of this. Now, of course, there are controlling factors. But there's one important organ that really calls the shots. Let me introduce you to the liver. Disclosure is not relevant to this talk. Here's the liver. It's one of the largest organs of the body, just nestling under the ribs there. A kilogram to a kilogram and a half of intensely metabolically active tissue that filters all the food you eat. Your body does not see the food you eat. It depends on what the liver does with it. So the liver will turn carbohydrate into fat. It will turn protein into carbohydrate if there's excess. It does magic things. And of course, it's controlled by insulin. But one of the main things it does is to regulate the level of glucose in the blood. Regulate? It absolutely determines it. Now, we all woke up this morning. We're all alive. That's marvelous. And you might wonder how you managed to stay alive, because your brain demands fuel all the time, and you weren't eating overnight. And in everyday life, the brain can only burn glucose. One organ in the body that is glucose dependent, normally. So, where does it get it from? Step forward, the liver. Here we have the liver putting out glucose into the blood, second by second, minute by minute. It's a very rapid process. And in fact, every hour, a person with normal insulin sensitivity of the liver will be producing 10 grams an hour. So, you, Mr. or Mrs. Normal, would have produced 80 grams of glucose while you were asleep. This is where most of our fuel comes from. That's fine. Fine only if the regulation works. And you'll see this indication of a controller tap there that is controlled by insulin. Now, if insulin's working properly, that's fine. But if the liver is resistant to insulin, things start going wrong. And so, quite early on in our research, we discovered that, in fact, insulin resistance in the liver was quite different to the rest of the body. And it seemed to be mainly determined by fat. We now know it's solely determined by the amount of fat in the liver. It really gums up the work for complicated reasons, but it still gums up the works. But if there's insulin resistance, you'll appreciate that causes the tap to stick open and glucose pours out. And the bottom line is it fails to stop glucose pouring into the rest of the body. So in type 2 diabetes, the average rate of production of glucose is 15 grams an hour. 50% raise. That's a huge amount when you consider this is a dynamic process. It only takes 90 minutes for every molecule of glucose in your blood and extracellular fluid to turn over. In other words, it's not static, and it's all due to the liver and its ability to respond to insulin. Now, that bit of crushingly simple how the body works information is important to understanding where we're coming from. So, in the first study testing the ideas that uh, uh, I had in 2006, put them together as a hypothesis, 
we tested them. This is one piece of information from that study, the counterpoint study. And I'm showing you an MRI scan, but not an ordinary scan. Every pixel in this image is color coded for the amount of fat at that point in space. 100% is red down to black. So the fat under the skin, there's the front of your tummy, there's the back, is red, it's fat. Inside the main blood vessel, the aorta, it's black, it's mainly water. But just look at this, because this is across the upper part of the tummy, that is the liver, and it's a horrible bluish green color, and strictly 36% liver fat. This was a person with very ordinary type 2 diabetes with no known liver problem. Well, in this counterpoint study, we got people to lose weight and studied them after 15 kilograms of weight loss eight weeks later. That's the same person. Their liver had gone back to normal, 2% liver fat. So you see, this is entirely correctable, but here is the famous graph of what happened to blood glucose. I can tell you in a lifetime of testing ideas. This is the idea and the test that came out so dramatically positive, it was breathtaking. The plasma glucose came down to normal within seven days, one week, after stopping the drugs. So, as the, night, the previous lecture nicely reflected, drugs don't do that much, so you stop them, and in this circumstance, bang, on 800 kilocalories a day. It sounds brutal, but it was designed to be humanly possible for various reasons that we can discuss. And we were able to do various metabolic tests to discover why things were happening. At seven days, the liver fat had fallen substantially, and the insulin resistance of the liver had gone back to zero. Seven days. This is metabolism. Things happen rapidly. Also, hardly ever talked about the fat in the blood, which we call triglyceride, that your doctor won't have even mentioned to you, probably, is 50% raised in diabetes. But we've known for a long time drugs aren't good at shifting it, and specialists have shrugged their shoulders and walked away from the problem. But it had fallen back to normal within a short time of starting the diet. So that was a dramatic change. But even more surprisingly, the other part of the idea that I'd had turned out to be true as well. There was a slow improvement in the function of the pancreas. Now, this was incredibly controversial. Uh, I, I was nicely introduced by Sam saying that I was saying type 2 diabetes could be reversible. When you say something that runs against what the world believes, the brickbats start. And this produced huge controversy at the time. Now it's faded into history. But let me just take you through this idea. Now this is the most complicated slide I'll show you, so bear with me. But this really is the idea that we were testing in that study. First of all, that positive calorie balance, just eating an extra mouthful or so of food every day over a very long period of time would slowly cause the liver fat to build up. Now there's one really important point, and it links to the previous lecture, pre-existing muscle insulin resistance. Now, what's that going to do? Well, let me just move aside for a moment and explain what we were doing over the previous few years, which was using magnetic resonance technology to look into the body to follow what happened to carbohydrate after it was eaten. If insulin sensitivity is normal, by now, 11 o'clock, you'd be storing about one-third of the amount of carbohydrate you ate as breakfast as glucose in muscle, which is stored as glycogen. But if you're insulin resistant, you store almost none. What happens to the excess glucose? Where does it go? Well, the liver changes it into fat, which is why it's very relevant to list here. 
But we already know that the liver fat will produce insulin resistance. And so we can imagine that a vicious cycle, resistance to the control of glucose output, that causes the insulin levels to rise. And rather bizarrely, it's just a fact of nature, that stimulates this process of turning glucose into fat. And the product of fat that's made is one particular fat that's actually the most damaging for the pancreas. So here we have a vicious cycle that grinds on slowly over a long period of time. Plasma glucose slowly rises. We're talking about a decade or so. But that's not all. The liver controls the output of fat to the body. It just manages the energy economy. Glucose we've talked about, this is the fat, the triglyceride in the blood. And ordinarily, that would be on its way to be stored in a nice, safe storage space under the skin, metabolically safe. But if those stores are relatively full, it will build up. And that's the form of the neutral fat or triglyceride that the liver produces. And that is going to deliver too much fat to the poor old beta cell, which struggles to cope and eventually will stop producing quite as much insulin. Gradually goes down over time. Plasma glucose stays up for longer after meals. That causes more insulin secretion, more turning of glucose into fat. This was a basic idea, way back in prehistory now, that we tested in the counterpoint study. So 2011, the world changed. It didn't know it was changing at the time. It argued vehemently. But the world changed, and we've been able to move forward. So I can now describe where we've got to with everything. But a word about the diet that we used. What was the diet? Well, to lose weight, it has to be simple and manageable. And from listening to patients for several decades, I had a pretty good idea of what might do this. So we used a low-calorie approach with a liquid diet takes away the day-to-day -day burden of decisions about what to eat and how much to eat. Much to my surprise, I discovered people actually liked it. I'd calculated we would need to get 15 kilograms of weight loss to show the effects. The study got 15.3 kilograms of weight loss on average in the whole group. And there's an important point there, which is often forgotten. We're social eaters, humans. Just look around anywhere, you'll see people meeting, and food is part of a social meeting. So don't talk about referring an individual to a dietitian or advising an individual to change a diet. This is a family matter. Very important. But because it was a rapid weight loss, this is something that's humanly possible, and people are successful in doing this, whereas many people who've done it have been markedly unsuccessful in using any other approach. And one other thing... Please, no new exercise to lose weight. This mantra, to lose weight you need to uh, walk more and eat less, is true, but only when you realize those two have to be frame-shifted. So during the weight loss phase, please, no new exercise. If people do exercise, great, carry on. Because new exercise, when it started, in induces compensatory eating. Probably the best kept secret in the whole of the weight control field. So, by understanding that, we were able to produce in study after study, 15 kilograms weight loss, going down to about 10 kilograms at one year, but still very appreciable weight loss. All of this is written up in this book. Now, this isn't a commercial break, because all the profits of this book go to Diabetes UK, I'd just like to flag up the fact that they provided the research funding against the run of expert advice to give it a whiz, to see if it worked. And it's produced enormous effects. So everything's written up in that book, and in fact most of the information's readily available on our website. But in order to show that this was really a simple matter, we wanted to test it in general practice. So we ran the direct study together with my colleague Mike Lean in Glasgow, to get a bigger population involved. And just in the last 
a couple of weeks, we've been able to talk about the five-year effects. This was a two-year study, a randomized control study, but the intervention group, we continue to follow up, just with a low-cost intervention, just with three monthly visits to the nurse. That fell apart a bit because the turnover of staff in general practice, in general, is quite high. And perhaps it wasn't delivered entirely as intended, but even so, people were still 6.1 kilograms lighter than baseline after five years. That's really quite remarkable, set against most other studies of so-called dietary weight loss. 13% were completely off the drugs, completely in remission still. But look at this. This is of profound interest to the public health. Over half uh, uh, were free of serious side effects compared with people who had the best treatment according to NICE guidelines. That was our control group. So looking back, what were the specific items that people had I uh, managed to avoid. Well, gallbladder disease was less in the group with weight loss than the group of followed up conventionally. Less metabolic problems causing admission to hospital. Less infections. Less assorted other things. But the really jaw-dropping information is this. That there was a profound decrease in the number of new cancer decreases. Uh, in the uh, follow-up group. Let me just explain that some people have left the study. So the people who are followed up were the ones who are still in the study. There were no new cancers over five years in that group. There were eight in the others. Now, if we wind it back to the start line and say, OK, how about at the start? In the control group, nice guidelines, eight new cancers over five years. In the intervention group overall, one person who had in fact dropped out and may well have put on weight again, had one cancer. Eight to one, that's a huge effect size. Now, this requires to be tested in other studies, but it fits in with the experience after bariatric surgery. In other words, after profound weight loss, cancer incidence goes down. These data are even more dramatic. By themselves, the numbers are very small. I wouldn't want to overemphasize any certainty here, but wow, eight to one, those are pretty good odds. So, what's happening? Well, NHS England took up the direct study results and rolled it out as a pilot program. Could it work? Could it save money? Could it save health across the UK? And I participated in the design of this and was rather worried by the fact that these were independent private companies that NHS England insisted had to deliver the intervention. But in fact, the results of 12 months are staggering. In the general population, with this low-cost intervention, nearly 11 kilograms weight loss at one year. Because of this, uh, just at the end of last month, it's been announced it's going to be rolled out to every area in Britain. Now, that's wonderful, although it's only for people in the first six years of type 2 diabetes, only aged 25 to 65 at the moment. That's something that I'm uh, battling against. Um, but this is one way of doing it. It's not the only way. And that's emphasized on my final slide. I hope I've given you a different perspective on type 2 diabetes, just like we've got a different perspective on our angel here. And I hope you'll agree with me that, yes, type 2 diabetes is a state of excess fat inside the liver and pancreas. No other definition. And also, that weight loss by any means will improve control, perhaps achieve remission in most, but it's the primary aim of therapy that we ought to be gunning for. So yes, this fits in precisely with the message of the first talk. Here we have a simple demonstration of a way ahead to health. Thank you.